Dear Professor David, we are greeting you in our project in the frameworks of the city as a classroom. I prepared some questions about Mediterranean cities because it's one of the focus of your research and it's a really interesting yep. topic. Dear Professor David, as a professor of Mediterranean history with a particular interest in Italy, Spain and the rest of the Mediterranean during the Middle Ages and Renaissance, could you please describe the main characteristics of Mediterranean cities? Which factors influenced the development of these areas? Well, it's a good question. Um, somebody who writes about the ancient world, the Greek and Roman world, has pointed out that the cities in the ancient world tended to be very small, with the exception of some uh, very, very, very large cities, Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Carthage for a time. Um, and in a way, the same is true of the Middle Ages, that uh, the Mediterranean cities tended to be very numerous, but really quite small. So although Constantinople, which you can argue whether it's in the Mediterranean or not, I mean, that's a separate question, uh, that at its peak may have had about a million inhabitants. Though at other times, towards the time of the Turkish conquest, it shrank to just a few tens of thousands. And Rome also went up and down uh, from being hundreds of thousands to being just a few thousand. So um, what one's really looking at is a multiplicity of cities, predominantly quite small, uh, and cities which therefore acted as a drain on the resources of the countryside. They had to feed themselves. Um, and which therefore became quite important centers of trade. You think of Genoa, for instance, which was very important in the grain trade. Uh, you think of Dubrovnik, which is, it's a tiny city, and yet it had, towards the sort of 16th century, it had the largest fleet, the largest number of ships of any city in the Mediterranean, even more than Venice. So um, it's, this, it's this very special relationship with cities, trade, and the way in which the trade not merely um, fed the cities, literally fed the cities, but also created networks that encompassed the whole Mediterranean and crossed the boundaries between Christendom and Islam, between the Latin or Catholic world and the Greek Orthodox world, and so on. Thank you so much. Uh, because your special focus of interest is Italian cities and Spanish cities, the next question exactly about them. In your opinion, what is the different about Italian and Spanish cities in the Middle Ages from other places? Well, one would have to think about the Italian cities and the Spanish cities separately. And even then you have to divide it up into different political zones. So in Spain, you have the big kingdom, which for most of the Middle Ages didn't actually have a frontier on the Mediterranean, the Kingdom of Castile. And then you've got Aragon, which was part actually of a confederation of lots of little entities, um, Catalonia, the most famous, which included therefore Barcelona. Uh, so you've got this, uh, these political structures, which meant that cities tended to play rather different roles in these different kingdoms. And then when you look at Italy, you find there's a difference between the way cities function in the north of the peninsula, from Rome northwards, where you have a very large number of free republics from the 12th century onwards, which then turned into miniature principalities by the 15th century. And in the south, you have kingdoms. You've got the Kingdom of Naples, the Kingdom of the Island of Sicily. I know actually Sardinia, well, that's a different story. But um, the, in the kingdoms, the cities tended to be under much tighter royal control. So the political institutions were very different in these different regions. And even within the area of the republics, you have a first phase in the 
12th century in particular, when the republics are really aristocratic um, uh, republics ruled by an elite of local nobility, rich merchants, and so on. Uh, and later on, more popular artisan groups became involved, sometimes through a series of revolutions, became involved in the government of these cities. So there are really very significant differences among all these different regions. And one particular difference which separates Sicily, to some extent southern Italy, and large areas of Spain from northern Italy is the fact that the cities in Sicily, Spain, were multicultural. That's to say you had a mixed population, which, it, depending on the history of the particular city, but they would tend to contain large numbers of Jews and Muslims, as well as Christians, uh, even after the Christian conquest of Muslim Spain. So they were places where sometimes a tense relationship developed, but by and large, quite a positive relationship developed between these different communities. Uh, I wouldn't say that they were necessarily the most tolerant places on earth, uh, but, but nonetheless, people learned how to live together um, and conduct business together. Um, I mean, there were often these communities had special involvement in things like the textile trade, the ceramic trade, and so you'd have Christians and Muslims making pottery together in Valencia. You'd have uh, Christians and Jews making silk textiles together in Palermo, that sort of thing. It is believed that history is written by rulers, kings, emperors. In your book, Frederick II, A Medieval Emperor, you show that Frederick's reign marked in a wider historical context of his enormous empire demands. Can we compare Frederick II with Charles V, who lived around 300 years after him? Those reign had more influence on the development of the empire and the formation of cities. Yes, well, the, uh, the broad comparison between the two is certainly a very interesting one. Uh, in my book on Frederick II, in the English edition, at any rate, uh, the first illustration is actually of Charles V wearing the coronation robes of Frederick II. We don't have a picture of Frederick wearing them, but these coronation robes, which you can still see in Vienna, actually, have survived right up to our own time and they became the coronation robes of the Holy Roman Emperors. Uh, and there's a certain parallel between the two. I mean, in the case of Frederick as King of Germany, as a ruler nominally, though he had great difficulty imposing his will, of Northern Italy, King of Sicily and Southern Italy, um, and also actually King of Jerusalem, which was largely a title, but he did go on to say, he had uh, this combination of territories, which matches up to a point Charles V's combination of territories, which however also included Spain through his Habsburg inheritance through uh, Ferdinand and Isabella in the 15th century. So um, Charles had a much bigger Mediterranean empire, which was then expanded further, of course, with the conquest of the Americas. So what he ruled was an extent of territory which was probably unmatched in human history. And within those territories, I suppose one of the interesting parallels is that both these rulers um, began to chip away at the, this multicultural identity. In the case of Frederick II, who faced in Sicily, rebellions by the Muslim population. He deported those that remained, about 20,000 people, to a town in southern Italy called Lucera, which became a sort of, if you like, large ghetto area for them. He also used them as his, uh, as his personal bodyguard. I mean, it wasn't an entirely negative relationship, um, but uh, the early phases involved a lot of really quite cruel warfare. So Sicily under Frederick became an almost exclusively Christian island. I mean, there were still Jews there, but, but it really lost this 
this mixed identity that it had had before. And under Charles in Spain, something similar happened as a result of the suppression of the Moriscos. So these were the Moorish population, the Muslim population, who had nominally uh, converted many of them, but many of them had actually retained their old religion. And in 1525, they were forced to convert, which many of them actually, again, only nominally did. I mean, they carried on their practices and the Inquisition occasionally arrived on their doorstep and arrested them. So again, you've got the decline of this sort of multiculturalism, which had characterized the cities of Spain for so long. It's the very final phase of that, really. Um, uh, so, um, and both of them perhaps also having reservations about the extent to which cities either in Italy or in Spain uh, should be achieving self-government. Frederick II set himself against those cities led by Milan, which were trying to achieve self-government and to shake off imperial intervention, particularly taxation. Charles himself became the overlord of Milan, uh, which was one of his major North Italian territories. Thank you. Next question, mostly like philosophical one, because you are, know a lot of cities uh, in the Middle Ages. On your opinion, can we say that architecture, what was that time and still we can see some of this architecture, cities, that old one, were some kind of textbook maybe, or manuals that contained information for knowledge maybe for people who would use it for their own advantages? How you think? I'm not really sure. I mean, um, if you go to the Italian cities, the medieval Italian cities, there are certain features which tell you quite a lot about the social and political organization. Um, there'll be the Palazzo del Comune, the, um, the, the um, governing, the, the, the headquarters of the city government, that sort of thing. Um, obviously the cathedral, which could play a very important role in civic life. If you go back to the 11th century, the bishop was very often effectively the head of government of the city. Um, so there are all those sort of signals. And then again, city walls, all that sort of thing, which tell you a lot, not just about the defensive needs of the city, but also about the physical expansion. So in the case of Florence, you have the walls expanding outwards again and again, the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century. So what you see now is the walls of the city as it was at its greatest extent, um, when it had become from the late 13th century onwards, one of the leading cities of Italy. So there's that side of it. And then there's another side of it, which is actually very interesting, which is the survival of the classical past, the preservation of the classical past. So again, if you go to Florence, you can still see the outline of the great Roman amphitheater, um, which became the palace of, in the 14th century of the Peruzzi family, who were one of the two greatest banking families in Florence. So you've got the sort of imprint of these cities as they were um, you know, a thousand years, more than a thousand years before. But that doesn't always work because in the case of Venice, which was not a Roman city, um, there clearly is, is nothing like that to go back to. Uh, but there are other ways in which Venice, of course, the very distinctive architecture of Venice expresses the special identity of the city as this aristocratic republic. Thank you for the answer. As an expert in Mediterranean history, in your opinion, what were the secret of successes of Mediterranean states, such as Venice, Genova, Neapolitan Kingdom, and other places at the time? The, uh, the secret of success was, I think sometimes people would point, if they talk about Venice or Genoa, um, Pisa, they would tend to talk about the spice trade, they would tend to talk about these ships going to Alexandria, 
creating great wealth, which then percolated into the interior and other cities like Florence, which I mentioned a moment ago, sort of caught up with that, became involved in that. Uh, so that would be a traditional way of looking at it. But in fact, as I said earlier, these cities, first of all, as they grew, they had to feed themselves, they had to supply themselves. And some of the relationships that were created to meet that particular need, the relationship between Genoa or Venice and Sicily, for instance, which supplied them with grain, uh, very large quantities of grain. So uh, without that grain, not merely could they not feed themselves, the cities wouldn't be able to expand. We know that Florence in the early 14th century, uh, five-eighths of the grain that Florence, the Florentines ate each year was imported, not just, it didn't, wasn't just produced in the local countryside, which was quite a small area under the control of Florence. So having those connections, I mentioned the Peruzzi Bank a moment ago. The Peruzzi negotiated with the kings of Naples to ensure that they could have enormous quantities of wheat from southern Italy, from Puglia, from the heel of Italy in particular. Uh, and this was really, you know, it saved the life, if you like, of these cities, but it also had big political implications because it forced the Florentines and the kings of Naples into a very close political alliance. They knew that if they started quarreling over politics, the future of the city itself was at risk in terms of its supply chains. So, um, so I think really that sort of sense that cities needed to protect their access to the most basic materials. I give grain as one example, but there's so many other things that were needed just to sustain the daily life of the city. And then on top of that, they could build this sort of luxury business in pepper and ginger and silk and, and so on. Thank you. May I ask one extra question? Yes, yes, do. Uh, because you specialize in uh, Italy and Spain, do you have the favorite cities there or favorite places? What is still you can maybe visit or it was, but it was really beautiful or your opinion about it? Well, um, I think in the case of Italy, um, the city I first came to know, which was Perugia, which is odd because mainly when I write, I write about maritime cities. Perugia is in Umbria, which is, I think, the only province, perhaps apart from one or two in the very far north, which doesn't have a sea coast. But um, it has preserved its identity as a medieval city very well. The core of the city is unchanged and has enormous character. So that would certainly be my Italian choice. My Spanish choice, I think, would be Toledo, which is uh, quite magical. Um, some of my ancestors lived there. And I, uh, I mean, it's not a Mediterranean city, really, in the same sense, of course. It's very far from the sea. But in the Middle Ages, uh, they did trade all the way down to Valencia. They sent wool down to Valencia uh, and out into the Mediterranean. So there are connections there as well. Thank you so much.